what, uh, what a terrific set of presentations we've had uh, so far and uh, really interesting questions. So we're going to move on. We're going to move on to the, to the next panel. And um, then after the next panel, we'll have lunch. Um, uh, and then we'll do one more panel. So this panel is going to be chaired by Carol Hills. Uh, so Carol Hills is the senior producer, reporter, and host for PRI's This World, NPR's flagship international news show, which is based at WGBH and co-produced with BBC World Service. She helped launch the program in 1996 and was one of its founding editors. Um, um, her previous positions include uh, creating a CBP award-winning pu week, uh, weekday public radio news program for the Northwest and producing radio and television news for the Christian Science Monitor. She has degrees from University of Vermont and from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Carol. Thank you. It's great to be here. I know you're thinking lunch, but this is going to be an exciting panel. We're going to make it. You've got a little drink and a cookie. We're all set. Okay. So, um, as I said, it's great to be here. Terrific speakers today. And um, I, I want to start by saying that I come from the premise that um, the whole bubble issue, which has been alluded to several times by Charlie and others, uh, I think it's kind of the critical issue of the day uh, for journalism and for politics. And I come from the premise that we figure, had to need to figure out a way to talk to each other and that we're not. And new media, however exciting it is, has really enabled all of us to sort of curate our own news feeds and curate the way we're being informed. Um, and so I think the challenge is for all of us to figure out a way to communicate across around anything we say it's all for naught. Um, so that's, and, and having said that, I also, as this day continues, I'm very curious if in the world of public health, there are, you know, forgive the jargon, but are there sort of red state school of public health? Are there, are there examples of places, <laughs> are there examples of places where people are actually working together across political divides or finding areas of, of agreement, because I, I do think it's really, really critical. Um, so that's, that's where I come from. Um, the, our panelists today are, are a wonderful group. They're you know, reading their CVs and looking at their accomplishments. I just wanted to take a nap. It's exhausting. Um, our first speaker is uh, Joya Mukherjee, Mukherjee, and she Joya Mukherjee is many, many things. Uh, among them, she's an internist, a pediatrician, infectious disease doctor, and a public health specialist. Uh, she's also chief medical officer at Partners in Health. She's worked in many places around the world, the, the common feature being uh, impoverished settings, resource-poor settings. Um, one of her many publications is a recent one. It's a textbook, the first of its kind. Uh, called Global Health Delivery, Practice, Equity, and Human Rights. That title and subtitle really sums up Dr. Mukherjee's scholarly interests, which is focusing on the human rights aspect um, of medical care, the, the actual delivery of medical care, getting away from a previous global health perspective of prevention, but how do we actually deliver quality me medical care to all populations, especially impoverished ones, and that that uh, delivery and access to really good medical care is a human right. I want to welcome Joya Mukherjee. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the green is forward. Uh, terrific. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me, and especially to David and Steffi for including me in the Lancet Commission. Um, I don't consider myself really a researcher. I am a practitioner of global health. And um, like many of the previous and really excellent speakers, I would say none of the what I'm going to talk about is specific to Trump or new. I do think there are trends that are much more nefarious that we're seeing. And so I will try to highlight a few of those. And I'm looking at the time. Great. So. Um, Part of what, and thank you for the introduction, you, whether you took a nap or not, you clearly read my CV, so thank you. Um, so when we think about global health delivery for the purpose of this discussion and for some of the work that um, I've done, um, I'm going to think about five principles that are somewhat novel in this century, so the turn of the um, 21st century, which is the delivery of care to meet the burden of disease. So not just prevention and narrowly focused things, but actually trying to address the entirety of the disease burden. We hear a lot now about treatment of NCDs in, in impoverished settings. That's, it's not like there's suddenly NCDs. It's just that we have moved toward treating that burden. 
The implementation of programs to achieve equity. So looking at the lowest quintile, the most marginalized people, how do we get health care to them? And I think when we look and you know, hear Adam and other uh, talk, we see more and more inequity uh, across uh, the US, but around the world as well. Understanding and addressing the social determinants, um, agreeing that we need to teach it. I found it not that difficult. I have to say, I think a lot of our students are very, very interested in this. Um, and then developing rights-based approaches to care, which in my view is really the public provision of health care and an active and engaged civil society. And then lastly, building local human capacity. So, um, the, the history of health delivery in most impoverished countries has very few people in it. <laughs> there are very few doctors, very few nurses. So as we're doing this, if we want to deliver care, we have to build that. And so that's some of the principle. So one word that I don't think has been um, mentioned nearly enough is neoliberalism. And I think that you know it's been touched upon uh, with corporate interests. But I think that if we look at the failings in global health, and I, even in the United States being part of the globe, that the neoliberal agenda and militarism are very critical aspects of this, um, which is not new. And I think when we look in some of the economic work, uh, that Atin was showing changes in the 80s that was really the rise of neoliberalism and the idea that the private sector would lift all boats, uh, which we know it has not. It's driven few, you know, continued inequality. And this administration is among the most neoliberal, um, if not the most neoliberal, in the fact that the idea of public provision of anything is on the table. So it's not only aligning with corporate interests, it's the ideology of neoliberal economic theory. Um, the whole notion of shithole countries, uh, as we heard, um, having worked in uh, many of these countries that were referred to as shithole countries, I can say that um, this was not at all surprising to uh, many of the colleagues I uh, work with. And I wrote a, a short article about, about the, the sort of how we as a liberal community, when we talk about the failed state and the basket case, are not a whole lot different. And we've sort of expected different levels of accomplishment from different people. Um, the US Overseas Development uh, Assistance for Health peaked at about $8 million. Um, and Obama did nothing to increase that. And now it's uh, Trump administration is calling for deeper cuts. This is 100 fold less than our military expenditure. So um, these are directly related um, in terms of health and death. And then the, the narrative of privatization, which goes far, far surpasses even the previous neoliberal with putting people from uh, corporate uh, America into positions of public power. Um, so I just want to start by saying that impoverishment, the ongoing impoverishment, particularly on the African continent, is something that we cannot take for granted. It is absolutely tied to capital. It's tied to neoliberalism. And these three thinkers, Nkrumah, Lumumba, and Cabral, all talked about health as part of their basic platform for liberty, that, that the idea of having health was part of the fundamental idea of African liberation struggles. And yet, even today, we have massive resource extraction going on uh, from Africa, an estimated $192 billion out of Africa in the form of tax evasion, uh, human resource uh, movement, um, and the extraction of the wealth of natural resources that are uh, greater on the African continent than anywhere in the world. And yet, then we will say that these countries are aid dependent when a paltry 30 billion trickles back in the form of aid. And I'll talk about what kind of aid that is. So these are not new, but I think in the light of increased racism, increased privatization, this is uh, becoming even more problematic. And meanwhile, in most countries, you know, have, from the 70s on, late 70s on, with the rise of the World Bank, the Reagan-Thatcher agenda, we had crushing debt. And we're now seeing it's, you know, we've wrung Africa dry, and now we're seeing it in Greece, we're seeing it in Puerto Rico, we're seeing it in, in parts of the United States, like Flint and Detroit, going into receivership. So 
when you have this large external debt, the paltry bit of money that can go for basic social services is really, uh, you know, very much overshadowed by the servicing of debt, and, we, and we'll hear more about that having to do with Puerto Rico as well. Um, I just want to say that this whole rhetoric of austerity, structural adjustment, neoliberalism is, I agree with Adam, not as much a Trump thing as this Paul Ryan thing. This is an actual tweet by F Paul Ryan saying, freedom is the ability to buy what you want to fit your need. Obamacare is Washington telling you what to buy regardless of your need. So the, the idea that freedom is not the absence of want and the absence of struggle, but in fact, Freedom is having money to buy stuff um, and being able to buy it. So this is just a really perverse notion that becomes part of our national dialogue. And then we, as a very important player in global health, are exporting this theory of neoliberalism throughout the world. Um, so for many of us, uh, when, when we started trying to deliver care in resource limited settings, or as I would prefer to call them impoverished settings, we saw that most public, the public provision of healthcare was at about $5 per capita in most African countries. And that was because of structural adjustment. That was because of imposed external spending caps like we are now trying to do in the US the gutting of Medicare, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act. And so on that, the rest of, the, and, and particularly coming from the US, imposed this idea of selective primary health care, which is vaccines, oral rehydration, very simple and cheap things, which does not address the burden of disease. It never addressed tuberculosis, nor AIDS, nor cancer, nor non-communicable disease. It's not that those populations didn't have those things. The uh, philosophy of neoliberalism is this is the best we can do without having a public sector. So when we think of the public provision of healthcare as fundamental, I think this is very important. And then I would just add just racism continues to be a major force in global health spending and the reasons for global health spending. This is an actual cover of Newsweek, backdoor to Ebola with this chimpanzee. And what we saw in the Ebola crisis was that funding was all around fear mongering and that once the crisis was over, the money was gone. And those countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, have some of the worst health outcomes in the world and have a deep need for massive investments in health infrastructure after years of resource extraction, ongoing extraction and civil war, and yet the narrative is a very racist uh, prevention only narrative. And even I can just say briefly that at Partners in Health, um, we realized that there was going to be a secondary epidemic of blindness in Ebola sufferers because of uveitis. And we couldn't even get Ebola funders to pay for that, even though there was actually live virus in the eye because it wasn't contagious. So once it's not a threat, then it is, so, there, so we need to think about what is the humanity behind global health. Um, and I would just say that, you know, social forces, part of, you know, I, I'm trying to, in my teaching, not use the word social determinant anymore, but actually social forces, because these are active, present social forces, and that, you know, trying to mobilize around social forces is an important part of our health, should be an important part of our health agenda. This is Cochabamba, Bolivia, uh, many years ago, organizing about the privatization of water. This is Flint, Michigan, and this is, of course, Standing Rock. So as we think about what we've seen mobilization around, there is still this role to mobilize against social forces. Um, many of us in the room were very, very fortunate to be part of a paradigm shift that happened at the turn of the 21st century when AIDS activists actually created uh, enough consciousness that new monies flowed toward the treatment of a disease. So that was new. And what we had to do, and Mary Bassett and I and others worked very hard on this, is you can't just suddenly treat AIDS in this health desert. So a lot of this work was building health systems for the first time and training doctors and training nurses locally. And so lots of money came into that. And that, in my view, is the paradigm shift toward the delivery of care, in fact, and away from just prevention only. Um, but this is at risk. 
And so this is PEPFAR funding. Um, you know, as you can see in the, in the initial part of the epidemic, it was going up. Under Obama, it really flatlined. And some of that was the international financial crisis. Um, less commitment to internationalism. But as you can see in the first real Trump budget, it's going, taking a significant decrement. This is in the setting of a lot of rhetoric of ending the epidemic, which is going to be more expensive, of sustainable development goals, which also will require funding. So if we superimpose this onto the epidemic today, we can see that there are many millions of people that need to remain on care and then even more that need to be put on care if we're going to end the epidemic in the 90, 90, 90, which I, won't, I don't have time to talk about now. So I would just say, uh, that we have a partners in health, and this is true around the world, this is not only us, realize that to do any delivery of care for a single disease, you need a health system. And part of this work of health system strengthening, which is kind of wonky and not very exciting, is really about a human right. And so a lot of our money, sorry, from early on um, for AIDS went to buttress primary health care. Essential drugs, staff, reducing or eliminating user fees and hiring community health workers. And rapidly with that, you can fill clinics and then you can find HIV, et cetera. And I think one of the problems we have in the United States is a lack of basic primary health care that can then identify, reach out and deal with the, the, um, the terrible adverse outcomes we have for our social, deep social inequality. So with that kind of approach, this is just from Rwanda, from a Lancet piece, um, the massively reduced child mortality in many countries, Rwanda was a particularly notable exception, or a uh, particularly notable example. Um, I just want to just say that health workforce, because of globalization, and I, and I had some questions for Atina, maybe we can talk to you afterwards about the idea of trade sensitive, but I think it's, um, it's I'd like a better word for that because there is the act of an ongoing recruitment of doctors and nurses out of places like Africa. We see this all the time in Haiti. And so the, m many of these health workers are, are educated on the public dime in free universities and medical and nursing schools. And yet then we are actively recruiting them to the United States um, and, uh, and, and Europe. So very important to think about how to reverse this tide. Um, and, um, and then, of course, evolution of drug access is just, uh, I don't have a lot of time, but, uh, you know, we, we know that putting powerful people from the pharmaceutical industry is another way to continue privatization and worsen inequality. Um, I won't talk a lot about public financing, but one of the things uh, that is very important is public financing of care um, and the governance. And I'll just end with these two slides. Currently, um, and the way privatization has worked in my field is that NGOs, often largely American like mine, get money from the US government. US government still is one of the biggest players, if not the biggest player. And because of our aversion to public provision of health care, we put it into this parallel system to hire experts, to tell people to change their behavior, and to do trainings in five-star hotels where, uh, where people drink a lot of tea. And nothing goes into the health plan. And the health plan, the, the national health budget, and this is a neoliberal strategy. This is a strategy to weaken the public sector. And in my opinion, what Rwanda has done successfully and what the UK has done successfully and Canada and governments that have done better on health equity is this. So either putting money into the government itself, which would be ideal, the direct budgetary support, or having at least NGOs support the national plan and then rather than five-star hotels and tea, putting money into universities. And so there is a model for this, but we will really struggle in the Trump era. So um, I just want to acknowledge the people of Haiti, the first um, sovereign uh, country that was created by a slave rebellion and the home of the resistance. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, a lot of stuff to think about there. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker, Martin McKee. He is an expert on...
European health policy. He hails from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and uh, growing up there in the 60s and 70s very much influenced his sense of social justice and what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. He's a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His research interests have ranged from the impact of austerity, government austerity measures on European health to studying the health impact of countries in transition like the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. He's a passionate advocate and defender of universal health care. And he sees his role in public health as making the invisible visible, bringing people who are marginalized into the public. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, yeah, so, uh, okay, I work in Europe, so what am I doing here? Um, well, de Tocqueville did a good job before, but I'm not going to try and emulate that. And um, I think it's important to say as we look across the pond at uh, what's been happening here, um, it's very confusing. And the first thing I should say that um, everything that I say could easily be wrong, and of course there's a reason for that, because as Niels Bohr famously said, or at least is attributed to him, um, Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And that is especially the case because Sandro asked us for data. And I'm here to talk about the environment. And as you'll hear, I'm going to be talking about climate change. And that's one of the great unknowns. It's one of the unknown unknowns, to quote one of your former politicians. And I've got to try and make sense out of all of that because I'm dealing with very incomplete information. Um, and, uh, of course... Um, my confusion is um, even greater because as I looked ahead and we wrote this paper in The Lancet where we tried to anticipate what would happen in the Trump administration, some of it we got right, a lot of it we got wrong because not much legislation has actually passed, but there were some things that we could never have imagined. I mean, how could I have known that Donald Trump's lawyer was going to give $130,000 of his own money to an adult movie worker? I mean... We never anticipated that, and the difficulty is that in trying to make sure that I'm as factual and as accurate as possible, I listen carefully to as many of the 24 interviews that Rudy Giuliani gave, and I'm still not sure what happened. So um, there you are. But maybe we shouldn't worry because, of course, Donald is rather busy playing golf, and he did put somebody else in charge of it all, Scott Pruitt, a perfect choice to head the EPA a leading advocate, and as we heard from Marion earlier, somebody who actually doesn't believe the agency should even exist. He sued it uh, at least 14 times, received huge amounts of money from the fossil fuel industry, claims there's no scientific consensus on climate change, and he's under separate investigations from all sorts of people. Um, so I've got to talk about the environment. So where do I start? Well, there hasn't been much legislation passed, but there's been a lot of executive action. Um, these are the rules that have already been overturned, according to the New York Times on the 31st of January. So my problem is, where do I start in all of that? Because I've only got 10 minutes or um, well, I've actually 13 minutes remaining, and I'm clearly not going to get through that. Well, as I say, we published a paper in The Lancet, which I hope some of you have read. Uh, and it came out on the morning of the inauguration. And in it, we produced a scorecard in which green indicated no risk to health. We used the sustainable development goals as our framework. Amber, a medium risk to health, and red, a high risk to health. And I know that we're all encouraged to go green these days, but we failed. Uh, we couldn't actually find anything that was green. Uh, but the one area that we looked at was the SDG related to uh, climate change. And we noted that uh, the president had campaigned on the plan that he would reject the Paris Accord uh, and uh, Scott Pruitt would head the EPA and so on. And that, of course, related to some of the SDGs. And he did. Uh, he did what he said he was going to do. We have another announcement today about Iran. We'll see what happens there. But I think we can be reasonably confident. The rest of the world applauded when we signed the Paris Agreement. They went wild. The simple reason is that it put our country, the United, your country, the United States of America, which we all love, all of us, even us, uh, at a very big economic disadvantage. The problem was, of course, everything he said was wrong. I won't go through all of the examples, but there was a report that he quoted that claimed that entering the Paris Agreement would cost trillions of dollars, um, but of course that assumed that nobody else actually did anything at all, which is not going to happen, and he thought that it would save the coal industry and so on. So there were lots of hopes for what it might do, but everything was factually wrong. Now we need a bit of data, Sandro asked me for some data, so I just thought I'd put up that. And the blue line indicates what's been happening to temperatures, the average daily temperature in the Arctic throughout the year in the last 
quite a few years. And then we have the red line as to what's been happening more recently. Now, that is completely off the scale, completely off the scale. And there's now a lot of evidence that we really have reached a turning point. The methane is melting in the permafrost in Siberia. The Antarctic ice that we thought was okay, we now find it's melting underneath. The water is melted, the ice is melting underneath the ice sheet, and so on. And the evidence is very clear to see. We can see the melting polar ice. We know that we've got unstable weather patterns. There's desertification taking place, uh, change in the distribution of vectors. CDC described the upsurge of vector-borne disease the other day, but we're unable to say that it was due to climate change. Well, they could have said it, but they weren't allowed to. Water shortages and conflict. Now, it's not just that this is happening in faraway places, because it's happening here. And we know what happened in New Orleans. We know what happened in Houston. And we know what happened in Puerto Rico, despite, as we heard, and we've frequently heard, the attempt not to count the bodies. So what would it mean in practice? Well, actually, there's maybe a little bit of good news because under international law, the United States cannot actually withdraw until 2020, um, although it's not quite clear that President Trump understood that when he decided to withdraw. And uh, the US administration is committed to upholding its obligations until then. But it will cut its contributions to the Green Climate Fund, which helps low-income countries to make the transition. Um, and although emissions are expected to decline, it's not going to come anywhere near what needs to be happening. So that's what's happening at the federal level. But of course, as you know, at the local level, it's rather different because you have the United States Climate Alliance, announced by the governors of New York, California, and Washington, followed by several other, seven other states. And they are committed to acting against climate change, uh, committing to, commit to achieving the U.S. goals to reduce emissions, uh, to meeting or exceeding the targets for the federal clean power plan. And these are states that produce 22% of U.S. emissions. Um, but there are concerns that some of the plans are perhaps a little bit overambitious. But there are questions that remain because, of course, this is a country which has a very high concentration of lawyers. Many of my best friends are lawyers. Some of them are sitting in the audience. Nothing wrong with having lawyers, but it does mean that you do tend to go to litigation rather a lot. And there have been threats that some of these measures might be unconstitutional. And in particular, uh, questions about the um, Commerce Clause. Co uh, Congress shall have power to regulate commerce between the several states. And the question as to whether the renewable portfolio standards are actually constitutional. They have been challenged. And similarly, the uh, feed-in tariffs. Every state shall abide by the determination of the U.S. Congress assembled on all questions by which the Confederation is subjected to them. And because the federal government has taken action in this area, there is an argument that the states are not free to do so. But importantly, we know that it can be done. Uh, the FERC did decide in the California Public Utilities Commission decision that this, the states can impose higher feed-in tariffs uh, to the levels of the renewable cost, but they need to do certain things. You need to make sure that you comply with the law. But it will be difficult because these states will be challenged by the fossil fuel industry. They can expect a very, very difficult time, and that will delay and it will obfuscate the whole thing, so we can expect lots of problems ahead. Now, um, I'm conscious that in the first session today, there were lots of individual stories of personal tragedy, and I thought I should try and introduce one in to them as well, because when we look ahead at the consequences of climate change, one of the important ones will be rising sea level. And here, um, the person that I thought I would pick on is the story of Donald, uh, because Donald is at risk of becoming homeless, uh, because if sea level rises, unfortunately, mar a Largo is likely to be submerged. So uh, he does have a number of towers that he can go to live in instead. Dead, so maybe he'll be all right. But we shouldn't forget this poor, unfortunate individual who may be a victim to what is happening. Um, but the real people I worry about are the farmers, and Marion has already mentioned them, because as we look ahead at the projections of temperature, the crop yields from all sorts of things are going to drop dramatically. Now, there is an argument, a libertarian argument, that the United States should stop producing agricultural products. Fine. That's the same argument that the Brexiteers have for the United Kingdom. The difficulty is that the people who produce all of these things are the people who voted for Donald Trump. 
Um, and he had his highest support in some of the rural areas and the agricultural areas. And if you look at the map, you can see, well, Nebraska and Kansas, for example. I mean, they look quite green and agricultural. So these are the people that are going to be heavily disadvantaged. So as we talk about who we communicate with, who are our natural allies, we might think that maybe some of these people might realize. And as we look at where the corn, the wheat, the soya beans, the cotton is grown, all in areas that voted heavily for Donald Trump, and they are going to be impacted by climate change. And of course, if that's not enough, they're going to be impacted by other things too. And as Marion has mentioned, the Chinese government is not stupid. It is looking very carefully at the electoral balance for the midterms and looking at where a little bit of sanctions here and there might be particularly damaging in marginal states like Washington State and elsewhere. Uh, but soya beans, if you're producing soya beans, if you own shares in soya beans, my advice, sell. What about the rest of the world? Well, um, Planetary Health, The Lancet has been a pioneer in talking about planetary health. And the America, America's actions are important here, and they're important in a number of ways. The US has effectively given up its seat at the policy table. The British have as well, of course, because they're terminally confused about their own problems. Um, when it is there, when the US is at the table, its impact is generally obstructive. So the leadership has been surrendered to the uh, European Union and uh, China. But the power of the US, as I say, is already very diminished. Uh, the UK is, is gone. This is, of course, having an impact on other countries that are then encouraged to become free riders. Fortunately, China and the EU are stepping up. But others are saying, well, why should we do anything if the United States is not doing anything? The United States has been very important in supplying the data and the infrastructure for monitoring all of this. Cuts to the budget on the uh, Global Environmental Facility, cuts to climate monitoring by other agencies such as NASA, and loss of research capacity because the United States is a research powerhouse and it's estimated that US scientists contributed more than half of all articles on climate change published in the leading journals. So this is a problem a problem for finding out what's going on, for making the invisible visible. What are the impacts? Well, I won't go on about it too much. We all know that food production is going to be hit almost certainly very dramatically, both in the United States and worldwide. And that has huge implications because many countries will be facing starvation. Uh, they will be facing mass population movements. But something else that I think concerns us all, and that is conflict because there is a very clear relationship between climate change, temperatures, and so on, and conflict. And uh, this is a paper, uh, a meta-analysis of studies since 1950 that have looked at temperature change and the probability of violence, interpersonal violence, and conflict in a number of parts of the world. And we have a very good example of that, one that you're all familiar with, and that is the Syrian crisis. Now, of course, the events in Syria have many causes, but there is now quite widely accepted evidence that one of the major factors was a drought that took place earlier this century, which led to a large movement of people from eastern Syria to Damascus and Aleppo and Homs and so on. And that led to impoverishment and that created a lot of discontent. And that was one of the factors, probably quite a significant factor, in the emergence of violence in Syria. So I think we can expect to see more of that with population movements in a world that has decided it doesn't want population movements and the challenges that that creates, and we are very clear about them in Europe, Germany that has accepted a million refugees and uh, many of them with problems that stem from what's been happening here. So where do we go to the future? Well, I think it is actually really rather worrying because if we look at the evidence in the Gulf Stream, the Antarctic, sea level rise, desertification, falling crop yields, falling fishery yields, all sorts of things, we have a problem. And the difficulty is that in a complex adaptive system like this, it is non-linear. We cannot simply assume it will just keep going the way it is. That we could easily reach a tipping point where the whole thing flips very, very quickly. And the fossil record, the historical record, shows that that has, has happened before. So there really is a danger as we look ahead. Is this the future of our planet? Leaving aside the threat of nuclear Armageddon, which we shouldn't eliminate because we know that there is going to be an announcement later on today. Um, but uh, in the presentations earlier, one of the messages that came across very clearly is that we should uh, make sure that we communicate our message. And I'm conscious that by me standing up here providing 
a limited amount of data, but a few graphs and figures and facts and things like that, that will not reach our target audience. That's not the sort of message that is going to get across to the people we need to convert. We don't need me, we need other people. But fortunately, we do have those people who can speak out. And here she is, and I'll leave the final word with Stormy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McKee. Uh, the news is that uh, Trump has pulled out of the Iran nuclear agreement. I just checked, noticed that a couple minutes ago. Um, our third panelist today is uh, Jacob Bohr. He's an assistant professor in the Departments of Global Health and Epidemiology right here at the BU School of Public Health. Um, Jacob uses the analytical tools of economics to the study of population health. Um, he has applied, he's focused extensively on HIV treatment and prevention in Southern Africa. Um, his current research includes the economic spillover effects of HIV treatment on patients, households, and communities. Um, and today he's going to talk about some new research uh, about uh, racism and mental health here in the United States. Welcome, Jacob. All right, thank, thank you very much um, to David and Steffi and Sandra for, for organizing this. Um, from the physical and natural environment uh, to the social environment. Um, I'll speak today about some joint work with Athene Venkataramani, uh, with David Williams and Alex Tsai on racism and mental health. Um, we're gonna focus specifically on a phenomenon that's become, uh, become a real interest to um, public health uh, researchers and practitioners, which is the, the very high rates of police violence and police killings of unarmed black Americans. And we're gonna focus on not just those events and in terms of the, 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 the direct victims of those events, but also their spillover effects um, in, in broader communities. We have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So there's been heightened concern about, about police killings of unarmed black Americans in recent years. Um, the, the, the plot on the right uh, shows just the, the population rate of police killings per 100,000 adults for blacks and whites. Uh, the bars on the left show totals and, and the bars on the right show for unarmed uh, blacks and unarmed whites. And so on the, on the right, you see that there's a, a, a rate ratio of, of five. So, Blacks are, are five times more likely to be killed and unarmed by police than, than whites. And this has, this has raised um, quite an alarm in the public health uh, community. And these, these higher rates, of course, come from specific uh, racial biases in, in policing and in law enforcement and the criminal justice system, which have been well documented, and also exist in the context of, um, of longstanding use of um, of state-sanctioned violence as a tool for, uh, for subjugation, uh, targeting persecution, and, and terrorizing of, um, of black populations, as well as of, uh, of, of other populations in the US. And there have been recent calls for increased public health surveillance um, of police killings. These killings have been called modern day lynchings. The, um, the, the, the image on the, on the top right um, comes from the new museum in, in Montgomery, Alabama, um, which is a, a museum based on the documentation of thousands of lynchings that occurred at the end of the last of the 19th century and in the first half of the 20th century. Um, the pamphlet uh, on, on the bottom is, of course, Ida B. Wells's work on uh, in documenting uh, in, in documenting lynchings and a UN committee of, of experts on people of African descent has actually made this connection linking contemporary police killings um, and the trauma that they create to the past racial terror of, of lynchings. And of course, the proliferation of these events has led people to, say, to stand up and say, no, actually black lives do matter. So we, we focus in this work on, on spillover effects on mental health. And so why, why this focus? Well, when these, when these events occur, they may have a number of impacts on, on mental health. First is through heightened perceptions and salience of systematic racism, institutional racism. 
Secondly, through a potential loss of, of, of social status, um, both perceived in the eyes of society and potentially internalized. Um, there's potential for diminished uh, trust in social institutions, for increased fear of victimization. If I believe that there are higher rates of police violence when I walk down the street, I may, I may be fearful. Um, heightened mortality expectations, uh, communal bereavement, um, the sort of em empathic identification with, with the victims of these events, and finally, the activation of, of um, personal or collective uh, prior traumas, which these events may, may, may surface. In trying to understand the meaning behind these events, um, we, we can turn to the wisdom of Twitter. Um, in the wake of the uh, murder of Stefan Clark um, in, in March, this um, uh, individual, Teru, I unfortunately don't know her, her full name, but she tweets as Teru, writes, what about our mental health? We're constantly seeing people who look like us getting gunned down, characters assassinated in death, and receiving no justice when the Dylan Roofs and Nicholas Cruzes of the world are treated with more dignity. So we, what we wanted to know is whether that response, which here is an, is an anecdote, um, exists at the population level. So we asked what the spillover effect of police killings of unarmed black Americans would be on the mental health of other black Americans who are not directly affected. There's, a, there's an enormous literature on racial disparities, a much smaller literature on racism and health, but even a lot of that work is predominantly descriptive. Linking, um, li linking people's perceptions of discrimination or self-reports of experienced discrimination to health outcomes. Um, but it's, it's hard to draw a causal link there, as racism is a difficult exposure to, to randomize and one you cannot ethically, you cannot ethically randomize. So what, what we do here is we exploit the quasi-random timing of these specific events in terms of police shootings um, as a natural experiment to look at the impact of, of these events, which are widely perceived to reflect structural racism. Um, and I, I will say that there's, of course, a debate about the various reasons for why these, why these events occur. And the sort of important point to make here is that although any individual event is multi-determined, the much higher rate of these events in, um, in, uh, with, res with respect to victimization of black Americans has been linked specifically um, to policies and that there are, um, and, and that there is the, the widespread perception of these events as, as reflective of, of structural racism. So a question about whether this is sort of a, a, a new concept in terms of the impact of, of racism on health. A lot of this literature focuses on interpersonal racism. When it focuses on structural racism, it focuses on um, more material bases of structural racism, redlining, where people can live, um, access to, to wealth disparities and access to other socioeconomic resources, um, and then internalized racism. But these sort of experience, these almost secondary experiences of interpersonal r racism here, or these, ex these occasions in which structural racism is made more salient, um, there's been less literature specifically on how people respond to these, uh, to these situations. And because of the ubiquity of these situations, they may be important in understanding racial disparities in health. So what we did was we linked uh, new data um, that have been compiled on, on police killings from the Mapping Police Violence Database with the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which you can download from the CDC website. Um, and, and we estimate the mental health impact of exposure to a police killing in the same state um, in, the, in, the, in the 90 days prior to the, to the BRFSS interview. The Mapping Police Violence Database is an incredible resource. And for people who are interested in this topic, I, I really encourage you to, to check this out. It's, it's um, mappingpoliceviolence.org, I believe. Um, and they have, acknowledging that vital uh, statistics are, are woefully underreported, have gone through media reports and social media and have this really extensive listing of, um, of, 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 uh, of police killings and are able both to corroborate every single instance and validate it as well as to document exactly where it happened, the age, sex, and race of the victim, whether the victim was allegedly armed or unarmed cause of death, and cause of death. So it's an amazing database that people are inter interested in this. And we link these data up with data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, 
which asks a single but important in the illuminating measure of mental health, which is a single item about whether in thinking about your mental health, which includes stress, depression, and problems with emotions, for how many days during the last 30 was your mental health not good? Okay, so this is just a simple um, number of poor mental health days measure. We look at these exposures, we focus here on state level exposures. We do this in part because that's how the data are, we don't have access to um, sub-state geographic identifiers, but there's also reason to believe that state level exposures are meaningful. Um, a lot of these events are covered more rigorously in the state and local media markets than they are nationally. This plot shows you the Google searches for specific names of, um, of victims of police killings um, and shows you that uh, there's a higher density of Google searches in the state in which the, in which the event occurred. So even though some of these events have received national attention, there's, there are still higher rates of, of, of interest and higher salience in the particular states in which the events occur. So this is a meaningful exposure in terms of people's awareness. It's also a meaningful exposure in terms of the interpretation of these events um, as re potentially reflecting uh, police community relationships and state legal environments. I will mention that because some of these events did have national, um, had, had national media coverage, because we're going to be comparing what happened within, uh, within certain states against other states, this is actually going to attenuate our effect estimates, okay? Um, so we're not, first of all, we're not capturing those spillover effects nationally, but also because our control group is capturing those effects, um, the difference between the sort of treated states and the control states is going, going, to, be, um, is going to be biased downwards. So in our sample, um, which we're focusing specifically on, on, on black American respondents in the BRFSS, um, they reported on average four days of poor mental health per month. They were exposed to, on average, one police killing of an unarmed African American in the prior uh, three months in the same state. Um, and the rest of the descriptives are, are here below. So there are about 100,000 people in the, in the sample. Our core findings were that, that um, exposure to police killing in the same state actually increased the number of poor mental health days that were reported in the general population. So again, this is a population-based survey. This is not um, specifically the family of, 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 of the deceased. And uh, on the order of a, of a 0 0.14 increase in poor mental health days per, per shooting. And that's that top, um, top data point. When you multiply this out by the, by the number of exposures and by the number of people who are exposed, um, this implies a, a potential increase in, in over 50 million excess poor mental health days um, per year among black Americans. And so there's a question of, you know, is that, is that big? Um, and one way to sort of to pin this against other population health estimates is we, we, we thought about the, 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 the population mental health burden of another type of exposure. And so there's a, a strong correlation between diabetes and poor mental health. And what we found was that this was equivalent to about half of the population mental health burden associated with diabetes among black Americans. So it's a, this is a substantial population level exposure and as I mentioned before is likely underestimated. The effects really were concentrated in the couple of months following these events and we saw no pre-event uh, impacts, which was a, a falsification test in our, in our analysis. And we also found that the, the, that the events were really specific to police killings of unarmed black Americans and effects on mental health of other black Americans. And we didn't see any effects on the he mental health of white Americans. We didn't see any effects of police killings of armed black Americans. We didn't see any police, uh, any mental, mental health effects of police killings of white Americans. So this, this sort of specificity of this effect is consistent with our a priori hypothesis um, and the, um, the, the notion that there's a, a, the pathway here really is through raising the salience of, 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 uh, of structural racism. One of, the, one, of the, one of the most troubling aspects of this research is, is in you know, a, a direction that we're, that we're now pushing this, where we, um, there's been a pathway that has been proposed from maternal stress to, um, uh, to adverse birth outcomes. And that this, 
the maternal stress associated with racism may contribute to the black-white uh, birth outcome disparities that, that exist in the US. And what we actually found when we run the same regression uh, looking at birth weights instead of mental health is we, this, is we, we see the same patterns um, where babies born who are exposed uh, in utero to these events um, had lower birth weights than, uh, than, than babies who were, who, were, um, who were in utero during a period when, when these events didn't, did not occur. So our finding here is that police killings of unarmed black uh, Americans have causal spillover effects on the mental health of others in the general population. And this approach likely underestimates the actual health consequences and mental health consequences for reasons I described. Um, our findings support calls to treat police killings as a public health issue. Um, which Dr. Bassett and, and her colleagues have, 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 have promoted. And it heightens, the, it, it points to a rationale both to obviously reduce the incidence of these, of these killings, but also to attend to the mental health needs of communities when, um, when these events do occur. The specificity of these effects really suggests the importance of racism as a key driver of findings and as a driver of, of, of health disparities. And that adds causal evidence to this literature on racism and health. I think it's important to acknowledge that police killings here really are a focusing case, but is, are likely the, the, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of people's exposures, secondary exposures to racist events and to events that, that raise the salience of structural racism. One of the things we found was that, um, uh, was, was that just finding um, the effects were largest amongst people who were not exposed to these uh, to, to other events in, in, in the prior year. And so some of the, some uh, further direction that we need to go in here is really to unpack how people are, under, are, are interpreting these events and, um, and the specific pathways to mental health impacts. I will say that there is a bigger picture here. Um, there's a lot of new research here now that's been, some of which has been cited today on the health impacts of group targeted social oppression. So this is a case looking at police shootings and, and, and mental health of black Americans. Julia Raifman, who's here, has work on the mental health impacts of uh, marriage equality laws and anti-LGB uh, rights legislation. Um, there's work that Athene and others have, have, have done on DACA and immigration raids and mental health and birth outcome impacts, as well as uh, work uh, following 9-11 in terms of looking at birth outcomes specifically amongst, uh, amongst Muslim Americans. And so this raises this, this, this notion that, that structural stigma or the sort of social power aspect of racism, when that's brought to bear, really has a negative impact on population health. And this is not a new phenomenon, but we now have all these quasi-experiments that have now demonstrated this, and this is an important, an, an important topic that we should really be, be thinking about. And it's important on, you know, in, in its own right but it's also important because of how these ideologies are, are used in that a lot of these um, pieces of legislation or a lot of, a lot of these events are used in, in ways and justified by ideologies that serve to lower so, uh, social solidarity, serve to justify uh, cuts to social programs, regressive tax policy, profiteering by the fill in the blank industrial complexes, and that this is actually bad for the health of all. And so whereas, you know, it's not just a question of specific groups that are targeted, but something that we should all be concerned about when we think about solidarity and when we think about empathy across groups, as well as building a robust coalition against some of these, um, some of these other attacks on the health of the public. Thank you. Thank you to all three panelists, uh, all very interesting, uh, very different aspects. Um, uh, a lot to think about here. Um, I guess I want to, one thing that really struck me in, um, in the first presentation by Dr. Mukherjee was, uh, was your discussion of um, neoliberalism. And I wanted to just raise it because it seemed neoliberalism um, economic policies are being pursued, certainly by Democrats as well as, as Republicans, possibly even more so. And um, whether you think this is 
going to be a fixture of any national government moving forward or whether there are realistic challenges to it? I mean, I guess speaking from your perspective in global health. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the path forward is through social movements. And I think that, um, to me, we may not be able to get rid of capitalism, much as I would personally like to, but, um, but I think we could fight for greater social protection and the delivery of public provision of health care, better public s services like education. But back to... Um, other speakers' ideas of campaign finance reform. I mean, this our government has been co completely co-opted by corporate interests, so I think we have to take that on. And there are groups that are looking at repealing, even on a state level, the impacts of Citizens United and things like that. So I, I think it's a big fight, but one of the things I think we need to do is coalesce around the intersectional nature of the impacts of neoliberalism on the black community, on immigrants, on, on health, on the poor, on labor, um, and I'd like to see more of that. Either, either of you other panelists have a comment on the impact of neoliberalism on your own area of research? Yeah, well, um, I think one of the difficulties we have is the way in which, and this is Thomas Frank's work, you know, what's the matter with Kansas and so on, in which you've got powerful vested interests that have completely dominated the narrative. And, uh, you know, he asks, how has it got to a stage where poor white people in America consistently vote against their own interests? And how do we reframe that narrative to recognize that, you know, when people are voting for Donald Trump, they think that they're voting against the establishment. I mean, we have the bizarre situation in the United Kingdom where people are supporting Brexit, led by a man called Jacob Rees-Mogg. I would encourage you to Google him. He goes canvassing for Parliament with his nanny in tow. He wore a monocle at school, and he is seen as anti-establishment. You know, th this is bizarre. This is a world which doesn't make any sense. And I don't know how we actually recapture that narrative and get people to realize that voting for some of these people is not actually in your own interest. They are exploiting you on a massive scale. And that's where I think we have a problem with, um, maybe in the European dimension, more of a problem with the public-private debate. Because it seems to me it's nothing to do with public and private. The people who are getting screwed are in the public sector, but they're also the small and medium enterprises in the private sector too. The fundamental issue is about the concentration of power by the 1% by the big corporations. And we need to recognize that they are only 1%. And the rest of us are 99%. Now, admittedly, you know, here we are in a country, and, and we in the UK, with our recent voter registration laws, are we're um, implementing Jim Crow laws in England now, sadly. But you know, I know that there's 99% of others, but you've done very successfully with gerrymandering and voter suppression to make sure that 30% you know, of those people can't vote anyway, so that helps. Um, but I think um, if we can try to recreate that image of, actually, these people are not on your side. They may be purporting to be, but essentially they're screwing you. I just want to add that I, I have enormous faith in young people. And I, what, what I think is quite beautiful about the March for Our Lives and some of the students from Marjorie Stoneham Douglas is they get, one, the intersectionality, and they're talking about you know black and brown people who are suffering violence, gun violence. And also, they understand the vested interests of groups like the NRA. So I think that is a good model forward to look at the money and look at how we bring more people. I also want to say that there's, there's um, so we're talking about neoliberalism. Angus Deaton, the um, Nobel Prize winning economist whose name has been mentioned a couple of times here, talks about us being actually in a post-neoliberal world in the sense that we're actually in a world in which free markets really have been done away with and capital is actually, um, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in an era of rent seeking by, cap, by, by capital taking advantage of the political connections that have been enabled through campaign, campaign finance as well as the revolving door. And that, you know, it's in a sense, there's an opportunity for people to come together really across the ideological spectrum, however you feel about markets, to, to say we need to get these, we, we need to get private interests out of our democratic process, or corporate interests out of, corporate, excuse me, corporate interests out of our democratic process. <laughs>
Um, I have a question just based on my years uh, working in journalism. Um, it has to do with the Gates Foundation. Uh, they have, play a huge role in journalism. It's, it's uh, controversial depending on who you talk to or wonderful depending on who you talk to. And they certainly have a big impact on uh, studies of disease and taking on issues uh, to some degree that uh, nobody else has wanted to take on. Um, they just have this huge impact. Um, and I wonder how your views on, on the Gates Foundation, it seems like if Bill Gates kind of you know, gets a whim, he has a huge impact. And the, the issue of a single individual, for good or for bad, having that and how it's affected your own area of research. Um, yeah, well, um, the collect declaration of interest, um, the London School did actually win the Gates Award for something or other, and um, I work with the Global Burden of Disease team and, uh, uh, and so on. But, I mean, that said, and uh, we've also published a paper in which we looked at the investments of the um, Gates Foundation, <laughs> and in particular their large shareholding in Coca-Cola, mm. which they got from Warren Buffett. So uh, we, we've been... Yeah, uh, it's a complicated relationship. I mean, the thing is that I think Bill and Melinda Gates have done a very good job in as far as they've done things. However, it's been distorting. We've, we've also looked in a paper where we looked at the impact of extra budgetary contributions and WHO's activities, but they've massively skewed what the international um, global community is doing. And they've skewed it towards infectious disease, which is fine, but they've skewed it away from non-communicable disease and injuries, which is not so fine. And there's been a fixation on technological fixes rather than addressing health system strengthening and the, the broader determinants, uh, which has been a challenge. But I, I don't quite know what you do about it because had it not been for them the world you know we would not have made the progress that we have made on the millennium development goals and so on there's a lot more that could be done um, but unfortunately nobody is stepping in but it's part of the penalty you, you pay for um, having an, a situation where public goods are provided privately um, these things should be paid for by governments out of general government revenues but they're not and uh, you know at least the UK with all of its failings and God it has many um, at least it is pay <coughs> contributing 0.7 percent of GDP to uh, to development assistance, not everybody else is, and even in Europe they're not all doing that, but somebody else needs to step up to the plate, so I don't really have an answer. Um, Dr. Mukherjee, I just wondered in your setting of creating, of yeah, building up health I, systems on I the ground. I disagree a little, uh, I mean, I, I just, I, I think there's a couple of things that are such a huge danger with the Gates Foundation. I mean, one is the idea of private enterprise. I mean, a lot of their nutritional work with the GAIN coalition is really around private enterprise and you know we see that the mass dumping of US crops on you know farmers around the world is just not helping us um, is really hurting people so I, I just think that the the focus on the private sector um, as and corporations as the solution is really dangerous and then the second thing that you mentioned a bit, Martin, but uh, is this what I call the gadgeteers, you know, the, the idea that there's a silver bullet. There's no silver bullet for the need to develop a basic platform for human rights around the world. And, you know, I think um, there was an article around 99 uh, about Bill Gates when he first visited Africa, and he said, what everyone needs is a laptop. Now, he's evolved from that, but I mean, what everyone needs is food, shelter, healthcare, education, and you know, if you have a laptop, great, but that's, you know, I, I, so I think when you look at paradigms like Cuba, um, you know, Turkey, Costa Rica, in terms of just basic health provision, that they're very low tech and very non-private. So I just worry about not only the skew to infectious disease, because I don't think that's it. I think it's the skew away from the public provision of services and toward this sort of privatized and gadget focused. Do you have anything? Um, I, I want to open it up to the floor. I have lots of questions, but I want <coughs> questions from the audience. Uh, would anyone like to ask anything specific to any of our panelists? Yes. The climate's yeah. a lot more important because of the lag time that takes, is now taking place. Things are speeding up much rapidly. For example, Bangladesh, one third of it's going to be underwater. What I didn't realize, India has built a fence around all of Bangladesh, three armored fence, three uh, levels uh, deep, and uh, with. Uh, 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 armed uh, uh, people all over the place. They're not going to let the Bangladeshis to go all back into India. 
and they're not going to be going to Burma or whatever. So what are you going to do with uh, one third of a planet uh, within probably 25 to 30 years? One third of that planet, uh, nation goes underwater. Are we going to have a refugee problem or are we going to just basically ignore it? I mean, so it's, it's not like, it's like Syria. I think we're going to be facing much more stringent crises in the relatively near future that we anticipated would take place 50, 100 or 200 years from now. Yeah, I think one of the challenges that we have as public health professionals is this point about making the invisible visible. You know, my colleague Andy Haynes and the late Tony McMichael and others did a tremendous amount of work taking the data and actually doing, you know, which a fantastic study, Jacob, really fantastic. Yeah. But taking disparate sources of data and making the connections, like that connection between climate change and crop yields and vector uh, change and you know all of the sources of data we have conflict and so on and we need much more imaginative use of the data that are now available from so many sources because we need to make that connection um, and Bangladesh of course is well, I mean, that's one of the most vulnerable. There are some countries that are going to disappear. Tuvalu, Kiribati, some of the Pacific mm. Island nations. I meet with them every year in November with these small island states. And, um, you know, these are countries that are actually preparing for evacuation mm -hmm. to mainly New Zealand because the countries are going to disappear completely. Oh, yeah, well, and, and the heat wave, because we're now getting to temperatures in Pakistan of a daytime temperatures of 50 degrees centigrade. Mm. Sorry, I have no idea what it is in Fahrenheit, because we don't use that heat. But anyway, you know what I mean, very, very hot. Um, and, um, uh, and in the Gulf states, and th those, you know, that, th that is uninhabitable. You, the all economic activity is ceasing in some of the Pakistani cities at the minute, simply because you can't move because of it. And all of we, so we need to actually make those links. We need to write it up. We need to publicise it. We need to get it out into the media. And um, you know, because I, I had a lot of other slides I cut out, but you know, Trump's tweets on climate change. You all know what they are anyway. Are you know, God. <laughs> Any other questions? I have another one for Jacob. If anybody, yes. really wonderful presentations. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to hear structural adjustment, uh, a phenomenon of the 1980s that's vanished from public conversation and explains the vulnerability of many countries to the new infectious disease threats because the public sector was dismantled. So I, and also really, I, um, I, I, so I, I have questions for all of you, but I would direct my question to Jacob and uh, first make a comment that I think your work has really inspires all of us in the room who have access to public data to think more creatively of how we can tie these data to discrete events. And uh, so I want to thank you for a really clever use of publicly available data. I thought I saw an impact of the deaths of white uh, people dying at the hands of police on black people. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to ra see if I caught that as it went by. <coughs> and to also note that one thing that we haven't talked about enough, perhaps, is this affects all of us, regardless of our <coughs> racial identification. And could you just speak to that? Yeah, th thank it's you very much. Th thank you very much for the, for, for the comment and question, Mary. Um, so it's first to the, to the observation about, about that data point. That also jumped out at us too, and we interrogated it quite a lot through robustness checks and um, you know, subjecting it to the same robustness checks that we subjected to you know, the, the primary results to. And it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't nearly as robust. It wasn't sort of consistently coming out in, in the, um, as either statistically significant or of the same magnitude. You know, this is, the confidence intervals are wide there. So it's possible that there's something there. We just didn't feel like we could come out strongly and say it. If there is, there's, one can sort of think, think through why that might be the case, right? If you think about, if, if, I, if, if, um, if a person of color thinks about their vulnerability as reflecting both bias plus the, the, the propensity of police to use force, mm -hmm. then that may be an indicator of the propensity of police to use force, which may then, because as a baseline rate, I'm, uh, I'm more at risk as a person of color, the, 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 one would be thinking, this, the, you, could see, you could imagine an effect along those lines, right? Um, in the end, we didn't feel like we could come out strongly and say that because it didn't sort of hold, it didn't hold up to all the robustness checks, but I, I thank you for pointing out the, that, that, specific, um, that specific data point. Um, I mean, I think as I said during the, during the talk and more, more, more broadly, like, uh, you know, a lot of these, 
Um, well, when, when, I, when I've shared these results um, with friends and academics of color, nobody is surprised. And when I share these results with white friends and, and academics, most are surprised. And I think this reveals something about just the, the total difference in experiences that people of color and white people have walking through daily life in, 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 in this country and something that we really need to th think more seriously about and that I, you know, as a white person that I need to think more seriously about and, and, and other white people need to think more seriously about in terms of making assumptions about how, how other people are or should be responding to um, events that are traumatic and reflect uh, real aspects of, of structural racism. And, and, and so there's sort of an empathy gap there that I think that, I hope that the, that the paper starts a discussion um, around that because, because I, I think that there's a real, the, the lack of ability to put ourselves into other people's shoes really is a, is a barrier to, to, to social solidarity and, and um, makes, thing, makes issues like this seem divisive when in fact it should be the complete opposite, that these are, these are events that, are, that, that, that we should be seeking to minimize regardless of who, of who we are. You know, I just want to add to that because I agree. Your work is fantastic, Jacob. It's such a pleasure to hear about it. Um, but I, when I saw that, because I noticed that too, Mary, I was thinking, wow, do, do black people have more empathy for white people than the other way around? And I can tell you that it, it was very surprising to me uh, back again to Ebola. When Ebola hit West Africa, we had any number of African people, people in the diaspora, black Americans trying to volunteer, many more than white people. And I just was wondering so much about how to look at empathy and um, from the lens of oppression and white supremacy. So I, you know, you see this um, also internationally, I would say. I really think that there's a transatlantic divide here. When you presented your paper in Denver, we heard about it within minutes because it was such a big deal. And colleagues were saying, you know, Jacob's just presented a fantastic paper. And we discussed it quite a lot in our team. Nobody was surprised, and we're mainly white. So I think one of the issues that we're constantly confronting, it's Alicina's work that I keep quoting, you know, the degrees of, race, of separation of the races in America is vastly yeah. greater than in Europe and the interaction and all sorts of other things, attitudinal data and so on, um, mixed marriages, any, anything you care to look at. The US is different. And of course, it's different within the US. It's different from Minnesota to Alabama, vastly different. And, and you can see that in all sorts of ways. So I think that there is an American exceptionalism issue there. I'm not saying that we're, we, I mean, it absolutely is not perfect in Europe. Of course it isn't, although it's nowhere near as bad as President Trump thinks it is. Um, How's the blood on the Yeah, the blood, yeah, we yes, yeah, yeah, managed to get out p past the hospital without falling in the pools of blood. It was quite an achievement. <laughs> and, um, you know, and the, the, the murder rate in London, which I should point out is actually one fortieth of what it is in Detroit, but you know that's. But I think um, it is, and one of the things I would make a plea, and I was just saying earlier to some of the other speakers, please for everybody here, do look at the evidence from Europe and for the rest of the world as well, because there's so much that we're doing. Jacob and I, we've published together in the past, and you know there's a lot that is going on there that has some relevance here, uh, but unfortunately we far too often, well we read your work generally, but uh, I think maybe you could read some more of ours. Okay, just, just to make one very last uh, quick point, the, the citable peer-reviewed version of those data will be out, will be out soon. Um, so please hold off on citation until that comes. Please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. Okay. We are